Church, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. I'm going to show you a video clip, and before I show it to you, I want to warn you that this video clip shows what I believe to be a genuine uh, demon possession case. A young lady uh, in, a, in a high school, junior high school, high school, uh, you can tell by the uniforms, this is either maybe Mexico or possibly India. And um, I would just say at the beginning of this, this is going to show some very, very scary things and viewer discretion is advised. If you want to, you can go back and, and watch that particular video clip again, and you'll plainly see what I've seen. I've watched it several times, and I don't see any evidence of this being fake. I, don't, I, I can't determine uh, that this is uh, some sort of stunt that these kids pulled. It honestly looked like this young lady was possessed of one, maybe more devils, and that they attacked her violently and literally lifted her up off of the ground, uh, I would say approximately a foot or maybe even more. Genuine possession. And, and now, if, if you, you could be one of two people, you can either be an agnostic or an atheist concerning God and the spiritual realm, and you would automatically say, because of that, I don't believe in spirits, therefore this can't be a spirit possession of anybody, and there must be a logical explanation, yeah, there must be a logical explanation for why it appeared that this girl was lifted up off the ground uh, in this attack. And they would say that they know of certain psychological problems that people have that mimic uh, someone reacting violently as if they were possessed by a spirit. Or you can believe in God or believe in at least in the spiritual realm and understand that there are living creatures all around us. They're described as living creatures in the book of Ezekiel chapter 1. John described them, of course, in Revelation 4 as beasts. But the bottom line is they are spirits and they have power here on this earth, especially over those who are not saved, who are not born again. And with that in mind, it's easy for us to say this looks like a genuine case of a, of a young lady who is possessed of a devil. We don't know how she got that way, but she's possessed of a devil. She was levitated off of the ground in this violent attack that happened to her. Her classmates are responding to that. They're trying to aid her. They're trying to not let her fall or hurt herself. One young man, uh, very gentleman-like, picks her up and is going to carry her, and that's where the video ends. But people, we know, those of us who believe the Word of God, we know and believe that these things not only can be real, but they are real, and they have been going on for thousands of years now. Let me show you another one. And again, I just want to warn you, this is freaky, okay? You might want to be careful letting your children watch this. I remember when I was uh, growing up, if you remember Sebastian Cabot, he was an actor uh, from the 60s on a, um, on a, on a family comedy um, back in the 60s. I can't remember the name of it. It had the little girl who had the doll, Mrs. Beasley, or whatever. But Sebastian Cabot narrated a, um, a TV show called Ghost Stories. And it was basically just different, uh, different scenes and different stories each episode 
of ghost happenings. I, I don't know if they were real or not. I was a little boy. And after about the third or fourth episode, well, I went to bed that night and I could swear I saw a skeleton hand coming up the wall between my bed, which was up against the wall, uh, between my bed and the wall. And the skeleton hand was climbing up the wall and I freaking out, run into my mom and dad's room, which I'm sure they appreciated. And uh, I said, mom, there's a, there's a goblin in my room. I called them goblins. There's a goblin in my bed. He's just going up the wall. And, and I can remember my mom saying, okay, no more ghost story for you. So I just wanted you to be careful before you allowed your children. You view this first, and then you decide whether or not you want to see them. But a man was told by his wife, that she had been experiencing nightmares or troubled sleep and different things like that. She didn't know what they were. She didn't know what was going on. The husband didn't either. But he decided to put up a camera that had night vision on it and just record uh, her night's sleep. This is what he recorded. Of course, being woke up in the middle of the night while you're still asleep is understandable. Um, raising up out of the bed, yeah. The, the manner in which she raised herself up out of the bed is an unnatural way simply because of the center of gravity of our body. Uh, when we are laying straight down, uh, unless something is holding our legs down by the ankles, it is very, very difficult for us to just raise the torso of our body up without our legs being used as a counterbalance. Well, this is exactly what happens to this young lady, I guess, raises straight up out of bed and looks at the camera and her mouth opens in a very unnatural way. It, is, it does not appear that her mouth is big enough to match the size of the opening that was opened up while she was having her uh, little sleep terror. This also is an indication that it's possible that this woman is being harassed or that she has been taken over or that she is being in some way used by evil spirits. Now, I got one more video to show you at the beginning, and then we'll get into the scriptures. Uh, here is a uh, young lady, uh, looks like uh, Hispanic. I think it was done in Mexico. She's uh, in a sort of maybe an alleyway, a very narrow alleyway or a hallway between buildings or something like that. And of course, the thing that people do now, is, especially young ladies, is they love to get on TikTok. Uh, and dance to their favorite song and hoping that maybe they'll be seen by millions of people and, and whatever. And so this young lady is dancing. You can clearly see as she moves from side to side that there is no one behind her at all. And then a face appears out of nowhere and not just an ordinary face. A very unusual face. Take a look.
The face is very pale, uh, very gaunt. Uh, it doesn't, I mean, it looks like a human face, but it doesn't look natural. And this is not a, a limited situation. I have dozens of videos of people just appearing in videos or parts of their body appearing in videos. All of a sudden you'll see a hand that doesn't belong to anybody in a group photo. You'll see a head in a group photo that has no body. It's there in the background and, and no one knows who it is, but they all seem to have this really pale grayish uh, uh, face and they just look like somebody that is dead. Now, again, you can, actually, I'm going to say there's three types of people. There is the atheist agnostic who says, absolutely no way. Uh, this has to have some sort of logical explanation. Maybe uh, there was a double exposure on the film. Maybe there's some camera tricks going on, maybe with Photoshop and AI making videos now. Someone did this and just, and just sweep it away. Or uh, you can be a Bible-believing Christian and look at something like this and say, you know what? I, it looks to me like this is a familiar spirit. And I'll explain that as we move along. The third type of person is the supposed born again believer who r reads the Bible, understands that there are spirits mentioned in the Bible, but they are constantly skeptical of any supernatural event that people tell them, especially, and I will say this to all of my pastor friends, I love you, um, but possession by devils, the appearance of various spirits in human form or in some sort of ghost fashion, a, a silhouette or a shadow, those appearances are real. And I, I kind of get the uh, impression from people that have emailed me or that have called to, t to share their story and so on, is that a lot of times they'll go and tell a pastor that they know or tell their pastor at the time, and he just shrugs it off and says, ah, well, I don't know what that, I don't know what that is. He doesn't want to be bothered by this. He doesn't want to accept the idea that not only do we know for a fact that spirits make their presence known in a visible, audible, and sometimes in a tactile manner, meaning touch. Not only do they make their presence known that way, but I believe that either the sightings are on the increase or there is an increase in our ability to record those sightings simply because, number one, we have security cameras all over the world. We have them everywhere. We have, we have them in our homes now. Uh, number two, um, we have cameras that go around everywhere we go in the form of a cell phone, okay? And no matter what cell phone you've got, more than likely that thing's got a camera and a microphone on it. And people are actually capturing uh, what I believe to be real supernatural events. We're calling this sightings because that's what people are doing. They are having sightings of supernatural phenomenon that science just can't explain, natural reason can't explain. And so that leaves us with, we must look at this from a spiritual standpoint. And the best place in the world to look at anything from a spiritual standpoint is our beloved Word of God. Let's start out, let's start out in, uh, in just the Gospels for right now and looking at the things that Jesus himself said or was recorded about Jesus in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 4, verse 24. The Bible says, and his, meaning Jesus, his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments. And those which were, and I have the other words underlined here, possessed with devils. And those which were lunatic and those that had the palsy. 
and he healed them. Now, here's what the verse is not saying. The verse is not saying that people who have diseases and torments and people that uh, have palsy and people that are lunatic and are uncontrollable, uh, it's not saying that those people are possessed of devils and that's why they're sick. That's a false doctrine. We don't need to be possessed of devils to be sick. This body is sick enough. This body is not this Superman thing that some people regard it to be. And I've heard people say, oh, our body has the ability to heal all manner of diseases and we just need to release that in faith. Everybody dies. Everybody that has ever been sick of anything, even if they got, even if they recovered from COVID, which I did, they still die. Okay. So anyway, it just because you're sick does not mean that you are possessed of a devil, especially if you are born again. If you are truly born again, you cannot be possessed of a devil. You have a throne in your heart that only has room for one. And that one in Revelation chapter four, the one that sat on that throne is none other than Jesus Christ in whom dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amen. So we see here plainly, we're going to stick to the subject. We see here plainly in verse 24 that Jesus took those who were possessed with devils. Now the word of God is the word of God and the word of God is always true. And if Matthew said, and Matthew was writing what the Holy Ghost told him to write. If Matthew said by inspiration of the Holy Ghost that people were possessed with devils, then mark it down, put your money down on it or whatever. People were possessed with devils. And we know from other stories in the Bible that this caused them to do some pretty outlandish and pretty evil things. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16, when the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. I love that verse. They brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. How did he cast them out? With his word. People, I can tell you, without any doubt whatsoever, the presence of the Word of God, the reading and the believing of the Word of God is in many cases enough to drive away all manner of evil spirits that would try to um, not possess you, but oppress you. And we'll look at a verse about that a little bit later on, okay? The presence of the Word of God, read, written, listened to, spoken, meditated on, okay? Read the Bible, and some of these things you won't have to worry about, all right? Matthew chapter 9, verse 32, as they went out, behold, they brought to him a, a dumb man, dumb meaning he couldn't speak, possessed with a devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake, and the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. Now, I had this idea that a lot of, maybe even all the miracles that Jesus did are a foreshadow of what he's going to do with the nation of Israel in the last days. And I like this because right now, the people of Israel, the Jews, uh, the Zionists, whatever you want to call them, the children of Jacob, children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, children of Israel, children of God, whatever you want to call them. Right now, they're dumb. And I don't mean that they're not intelligent. I mean, right now, the Jew cannot tell you about the Messiah. They cannot tell you about 
uh, God's only begotten son. They cannot tell you what the gospel plan is for them. They cannot tell you these things. They cannot speak these things because they have been kept from them. They have been hid from them. The Bible says that every time the Jews read the Old Testament, there's a veil like the veil of Moses over it, and they cannot see it, and they cannot understand it. And so when I see this story here, I see Israel literally possessed with a devil. There is a spirit that uh, controls uh, the Jews of this world right now. Uh, but that one of these days, that devil is going to be cast out. And lo and behold, they're going to marvel. And they're going to be able to speak. And what are they going to speak? Our Messiah is Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. Matthew 12, 22, then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil. Here's another one, blind and dumb. Think about this. This was Helen Keller's state. She was born blind. She was born deaf and dumb without the ability to speak is what that means. And I think, who was it? Annie Sullivan that finally came to her and broke through to her, her understanding and her ability to learn about the world around her simply by feeling the signs that she was being given by, she had the ability to put her hand on somebody's mouth and know the words that they were saying by feeling the vibrations and feeling the movements of the jaw and the lips and so on. Incredible story. Okay. That's why they called her the miracle worker, Annie Sullivan, because she literally worked a miracle to get Helen Keller to open up and be part of the world that everybody lived in during those days. But here we have a man and he was, or one that was possessed with the devil and he's blind and dumb. So we would assume then that he can't hear, he can't speak and he cannot see. What kind of life is that? Okay. It's, it's just no life at all. And he healed him in so much that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. Can you imagine the overwhelming feeling of being blind and deaf and dumb your whole life? And now all of a sudden you see everything and you hear everything. It would just overwhelm you. You'd be in tears listening and seeing this beautiful world that you've been missing out on. What a miracle. And all the people were amazed and said, is not this the son of David? You see, they can't believe that just this mortal man named Jesus can do all of these things. But we're going to find out here in a little bit why it is that when Jesus has someone who is possessed of a devil, what exactly happens in the spirit realm when Jesus shows up on the scene? Take a look at this. Luke chapter 4, verse 33. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit and I want you to notice this, the word spirit and devil uh, would be the same as what we were seeing earlier, possessed with the devil. He had the spirit of an unclean devil. In other words, he would have had what the Bible calls an unclean spirit. They are one and the same. So he has the spirit of an unclean devil, cried out with a loud voice saying, let us alone. Notice that's plural. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus? No, notice, what have we? There was more than one devil in this man. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Now, I, lo I love this. Because even though Mortal man does not know, nor does he care, who Jesus Christ is. I guarantee you, every devil knows. How do they know? He created them. He has shown himself to them. They know who he is. When he was born in Bethlehem, as he was growing up, when he was baptized, and the spirit descended as a dove and they heard the voice of the father. I guarantee you every devil in the universe shook in fear. Uh-oh. He's down on earth. He's in our turf, our territory. 
What are, what are we going to be able to do? We have to do something about this. We've got to kill. Now that he's become human, maybe we can kill him. And that was their plan. But they're like, let us alone, thou holy one of God. They know who this is. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, what a word is this? Oh, look at it. What a word is this? For with authority and power, he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. Now listen to me, people. There is a lot of false doctrine from false teachers and false prophets out there. It was out there before the internet. It's grown exponentially because of the internet. Convincing born-again people that they can become possessed with the devil. I uh, knew a, a couple, a young couple back years ago, and they had a rocky marriage. He made a, he made a lot of demands on his wife uh, as far as their um, marital things and so on. You understand what I'm saying? He made a lot of demands on his wife and basically used God to do it. Uh, you have to be subservient to me. You have to do what I tell you to do, blah, 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 blah. But the wife also, she had a horrible temper. And she was constantly yelling at him, berating him, belittling him, calling him names, screaming at him, accusing him of all kinds of things, and so on. They went to a church, and the pastor and his wife got involved with them and convinced them that the reason why they do this, the reason why she does this, is because she has a spirit in her that causes her to do that, and that spirit needs to be cast out. And you can't just cast it out any old way. You have to identify the spirit. You have to uh, call it out by name, and then you have to do all these things to get that spirit out of you. Likewise with the man. The reason why he is so demanding in his romantic relationship with his wife is that he's got a spirit, and that spirit is constantly uh, driving him and compelling him, and... Um, he needs to identify that spirit. We need to have, uh, we need to bring oil over here and we need to do this. We need to do that. We need to do this ritual. And I happen to have one and they perform these rituals and they pretend that these devils are gone and they pretend now that the problem is gone. But what really has happened is the devil didn't make them do anything that they didn't already want to do. They were just using these devils as an excuse for their bad behavior. This man treated his wife the way he did because he liked it. Gave him, number one, he gave him a sense of power over her. Um, number two, the obvious thing with the romantic side of a marriage relationship. And he liked it. And... So he decided, and they helped him decide that this is a devil inside of him and it needs to be cast out. And her, she yells at her husband because uh, she has this devil. But the truth of it is, she likes it. it, gives her a sense of power. She's decided that no man's gonna tell her what to do ever. And so she just treated him that way. And again, they use this idea of she's got a spirit as basically a way of excusing their bad behavior, okay? There are some things that we do, people, that are just our fault. We did it because we wanted to do it. It's plain and simple. Anyway, back to this. Uh, so they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, what a word is this for with authority and power he commanded the unclean spirits, and they come out. Now, people will ask, why didn't, why didn't Jesus want these devils to just go around proclaiming to the world that this is, I mean, isn't that what he wants? Doesn't Jesus want everybody to know that he's the Messiah? Number one, Jesus doesn't need 
nor does he ask for evil spirits that he knows that he's going to bind them and cast them into the lake of fire one of these days. Jesus does not want praise, publication, advertisement from devils. He doesn't want it. And I heard John Kilpatrick, who uh, led this, uh, this funny laughing spirit down at the uh, Pensacola uh, Assembly of God Church down there, the laughing revival that they had down there. And he was teaching about how Jesus came on the scene and there was a man possessed of devils. And this devil said, I know thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God. And this man said, did you hear what this devil said? Let devils teach you how to praise God. And I'm just like, I can't believe he said that, but it makes sense now. But anyway, Jesus doesn't want, nor does he need devils to go around singing his praises all over the world. Number two, Jesus does not want to be lifted up on some throne somewhere as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Not yet. Jesus has to go through the process of being despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief so that he can be taken to the cross of Calvary and there being nailed, pierced, Vinegar offered to him, hung between two thieves, numbered with the transgressors. He needs to do that so he can die on the cross and become the uh, atonement for man's sins. And he doesn't want anybody taking that away. Okay? Now, Luke chapter 4, verse 40, when the sun was setting... All they that had any sick with diverse diseases brought them unto him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. Here they're doing it again. And he, re and he rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. You notice that Jesus never gets into a conversation with these devils. I've heard, I, I'm going to be honest with you, I personally have never, that I'm aware of, uh, was part of casting out a devil from somebody. I, I've never had that uh, opportunity roll by. Uh, it's not because I stayed away from it. It's just, I've, it's, it's never happened. Um, but I've heard pastors talk about how they did this and how they did that. And you hear them get into a conversation with the devil. Devil, name thyself. What is thy name? And maybe they'll come up with some name or whatever. And what are you doing here? What you? And they get in this conversation with them. Jesus just says, go, get out. Or I'll throw you in the pit. Okay. He just says, go, get out, whatever. With his word, he casts out those devils. He's not about to get into a conversation with them. And when they try to praise him, he says, keep your mouth shut. Again, number one, he doesn't want devils singing his praises. Number two, he does not want anything that will forfeit what he's going to do on the cross of Calvary, because that's why he came. He came to die as the substitution for our atonement. Okay? That's why he came. But he he casts out or he he heals those that are sick with diverse diseases. Um, he lays hands on every one of them and healed them. And you have the devils automatically recognizing him, calling him out. Thou art Christ the Son of God. We know who you are. Okay? And the and Jesus says, I know who you are too. Now get out. Luke chapter 8, verse 26. And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time. And notice this, and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him with a loud voice, said, 
What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I beseech thee, torment me not. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for oftentimes it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he broke the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. Now, several things to point out here. Number one, uh, this man had these devils for a long time. No one was able to cast them out. No one had any, no one knew what to do. Nothing. This poor guy, I don't know how he ended up with all these devils, but he did. And it was no picnic. He was tormented every day and he didn't live in a house anymore. He's living literally with the dead. Now, eventually I'm going to take you to where can we find groups of familiar spirits or unclean spirits. And I do believe uh, simply because of the nature of what they are. I do believe that devils hang out at cemeteries, catacombs, place mausoleums, Places like that. Why? Because they love the shadow of death. They're comfortable in it. Let's move on. Notice that the man was naked. He didn't wear any clothes. The Bible refers to nakedness as a shame. It's a type of shame. So that when we sin, it's as if we have exposed ourselves to the world. And, and, and the shame of our nakedness is appearing and it brings shame to us. You ever had you ever had the new dream? I have. I don't think I'm the only one in the world that's ever had it. But you realize that you're in a place with people and you have no clothes on and you are desperately trying to find something to cover yourself up with and you can never find anything. Okay, that's just part of how God made us. The first thing that happened to Adam and Eve when they sinned in the Garden of Eden was, boom, they realized that they were naked and they sought about to cover up their nakedness. Who told them they were naked? Nobody did. That was just the first thing that entered their mind was that they were naked. And nakedness is a shame. Jesus told the Laodicean church to buy of him uh, uh, white raiment, fine raiment, so that the shame of their nakedness did not appear. So this man is full of shame. He is uh, abiding in the tombs and so on. And here comes Jesus. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I beseech thee, torment me not. And he commanded the unclean spirit to come out of that man. That man, listen, that man, according to the scriptures, and if you don't believe the Bible, you won't believe this. But that man, they bound him with chains. I've seen guys on cops on some of these police video things think, because the drugs are on, think that they had the ability to break loose from handcuffs. Listen, those things, they're not made out of aluminum. Those are made out of steel, out of iron, okay? You're not going to break them, but this guy did. And let's just, let's just say that it is apparent that devils give humans supernatural abilities. Now, ask the question, would this not be a reason why some people voluntarily become possessed? Now, they may not know that they're going to be uh, a wreck. Their mind's going to be like scrambled eggs. They're going to be crazy, living in tombs, unable to speak to anybody crying out, hollering all night long, howling at the moon. They may not realize that all of their humanity is, or most of their humanity is going to leave. But wouldn't it, wouldn't it be cool to have a superpower to where you were so strong that you broke handcuffs like Superman did in Man of Steel? Okay. 
you can't hold Superman down. And so if people had that ability, well, they would be like Superman. And that right there, in this wicked generation, would be enough to convince certain people to voluntarily be possessed with devils, okay? Now, in verse 30, Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there was there an herd of many swine feeding on the mountain, and they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them, and he suffered them. Then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. And when they that fed them saw what was done, they fled and went and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They also which saw it told them by what means he that was possessed of the devils was healed. Listen, I like this. I like this. Somebody asked me the question, my daughter. I think it was a question she saw on social media. You know, these rock stars, they, many of them, and they had, some of them even admitted that they sold their soul to the devil in order to get fame and glory and money and drugs and liquor and fornication and all the things that they ever wanted. And they became this super rock star. Some of these guys and gals, when they get on stage, Beyonce, for example, Beyonce says, when I go out on stage, Beyonce's gone and a spirit called Sasha Fierce comes out and takes over me. And you can literally see her visage change, her countenance changes. And she says, I have a spirit that turns me into this amazing uh, showman. She can sing and do things that are just almost unnatural. That if she didn't have Sasha Fierce, this spirit in her doing it, she probably wouldn't be able to do it. Guitarist performing guitar licks, some as long as 30 minutes. They're riffing in the middle of a song for 30 minutes straight, doing guitar licks and keyboard things that are seemingly impossible. And they say, I don't know, something just takes over. And man, I just let it fly. Okay? Um, you can see why some people would, would want that. Okay, Robert, uh, Robert Johnson, basically the man who invented rock and roll, went to a place, a crossroads. There are places where devils like to congregate. And he stood in the middle of that road there and asked the devil to give him the ability to play the guitar like no one has ever played it. He is at best a mediocre guitar player. Six months later, he shows back up at the nightclub that he got booted out of, and he's got a guitar now with seven strings on it, not six. And they're going, what in the world? And he says, can I sit in? Oh yeah, let him sit in. And they're just blown away. This guy is playing guitar and he's playing uh, riffs and he's playing things that people had never heard of and some guitars to this day, they're like, I can't do that. Okay, where did he get that power? Got that power from the devil. And listen, people, this stuff is real, very real. But here's the thing. The, the, the question was, if these, if these rock people ask the devil to, they can, if they can sell their soul for fame and money and everything else, does that mean that they can never, ever, ever, ever be saved? Part of me wants to say, no, they can never be saved after that. But I see a man here in the Bible that if we follow the word legion, what is the legion, like 12,000 soldiers? If we use the literalness of that word, this man's got at least 12,000 devils living in him. 
And when Jesus casts them out and they go into this herd of swine, the man instantly is healed. He goes and he puts clothes on. He covers himself up and he sits down at the feet of Jesus and he's calm. He's clean. Maybe even shaved. But he's different and everybody can see it. Some say that homosexuals, want, they, they have absolutely no, no ability to be saved whatsoever. I've led one to the Lord in my ministry, and there are more out there that I believe want to be delivered. I do. But anyway, that's the power of Christ, and these devils are real is what we're getting at, or the Bible wouldn't, I mean, we're talking about the Gospels being full of stories of people possessed of devils, people being made superhuman because of devils, people being made sick because of devils, and so on and so on. According to the Bible, these things are real, and they make their voice, their appearance, and their touchability, they make all of these things known to humans, okay? Mark 16, 9. I like this part. Because it's a story of deliverance. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Isn't that interesting? Did you ever read that and wonder why it was seven? And what was so significant about it that the Bible had to tell you? See, we, we're guessing that Legion had 12,000 devils in him because the word Legion. But we don't have an exact number. Here, God narrows it down. We have an exact number of devils that was inside Mary Magdalene. Uh, Luke 8, 2, and, a, and certain women which have been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. So we have Mark saying it. We have Luke saying it, a double witness. She had seven devils. What is, what is the possibilities here, according to Scripture, and according to uh, what we know? What, what are the possibilities here? that Mary Magdalene, uh, what could she have gotten involved in that would lead her to be possessed with seven devils? Because I don't believe that someone who is, you know, attending church and pondering salvation and reading the scriptures and God is bringing them ever near the cross, I don't believe that seven devils just show up and take over somebody like that. I think they're invited. I think a person puts themselves into certain activities, divination, witchcraft, sorcery, things like that, that cause them to be possessed of devils. It's like they've opened the door for devils to come on in. Uh, but what, what are the possibilities of these seven devils? Um, first, let's look at the Hindu religion, which wasn't too far from the Middle East where Mary Magdalene came from. Um, and in the Hindu religion, they've always revered a Naga. The Nagas were said to be seven headed serpents. The word Naga possibly related to the word Nakash which is a Hebrew word, which means serpents. And if you remember, um, who was it? Um, was it Josiah or Hezekiah that found out that they had taken the, uh, the pole that Moses made out of brass where he put the serpent on the pole and the people of Israel looked upon it, and when they were bitten by the fiery flying serpents, that they were healed when they looked at it. 
the king found out that they were using that as a prayer idol and they were burning incense to it. They were praying to the devil for crying out loud. And so when, I think it was Hezekiah, when he found that out, they called it Nehushtan because it's a derivative of Nahash. And I do believe that the word Nagaz is, a, is a, an Indian derivative of the Hebrew word Nahash, Nagaz. Nehushtan, okay? They all point back to the serpent. So you got these people, these Israelites, and they're worshiping the devil. And they're praying to the devil. That's what offering incense does. It's supposedly your prayers hook on to the incense smoke and right up to heaven, okay? I don't believe that, people. You don't need to burn incense when you pray. You just need to pray. Amen. But anyway, um, related to the Hebrew word Nehush, which means serpents, also... It reminds me of the beast or the dragon with seven heads. In Revelation 12, we have the dragon, the old serpent, the devil, Satan, and he's got seven heads. In Revelation 13, John said, I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns and I think it was seven, seven crowns upon those heads. But anyway, no matter what, this could be reckoned as the spirit of Antichrist. And in fact, look at these pictures again. The one on the right features Buddha. Hinduism and Buddha related to one another, Buddhism. And according to this icon, and there's many more like it on, you can look up Buddha and, and Naga, Nagas, and you'll see there's idols all over the place featuring Buddha and this seven-headed serpent. He's either being protected by it uh, or whatever. But basically, those who bow before idols and images of Buddha are praying to none other than the Antichrist. Okay? So maybe this, maybe this was what Mary Magdalene was possessed of. Maybe she had a, this serpent in her that had seven heads. And I want you to think about that in Isaiah. See, everything the devil does is an opposite, isn't it? In Isaiah 14, he says, I will be like the Most High. Okay? So if you want a really good picture of the devil, just look at paintings of God. There, there you are. In Isaiah 11, verse 1, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Seven. I believe that the seven heads of the dragon, the serpent, the devil, the seven heads of the beast, and the seven crowns, and so on, basically are the opposite of the seven spirits of God. So the devil, either God is going to fill you with the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom and understanding and of counsel and might and of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And I, listen, I crave to have these. Or the devil is going to fill your life with who knows what these serpents represent. With all kinds of evil things. Seven devils. Which would you rather have? I'd rather have the seven spirits of God. Uh, or, here's an interesting one. This is, I think, a, a foreshadow of the seven heads of the beast, which the Bible says are seven kings um, that don't have a kingdom yet. In Deuteronomy 7, God, uh, speaking through Moses, telling him, when you get into the land, you're going into a land that's owned by seven nations. 
Let's read it. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations, and notice this, they are greater and mightier than thou. Meaning, I believe that these seven nations represent seven devils, seven heads, seven kings, and so on. They are definitely m mightier and greater than us as far as in this world. They are. They're very powerful, evil spirits. Very powerful. And yet God says in verse 2, And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt, not make, thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them, neither shalt thou make, look at this, marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, and they that, uh, that they may serve other gods, so will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and destroy thee suddenly." Isn't it amazing that we have in Genesis 6 the story of the sons of God, which Psalm 82 said, Ye are all God's children of the Most High, yet thou shalt die like men and fall like one of the princes. God is saying that when these angels, these evil angels, fall out of their first estate, they become mortal. And so we have the sons of God mating with human women there. We have a warning here in Deuteronomy 7 of God saying to Israel, do not make marriages with these seven spirits, these seven devils, these seven kings, these seven nations which are mightier than you. Don't make marriages with them at all. I think, it's, I think that's giving us a foreshadowing of what is coming down the road. I think the marriage is going to take place again, just like it did in the days of Noah. I think that's going to happen again. Jesus told us, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Or maybe, maybe these seven devils that Mary Magdalene had, maybe... Maybe they are what's in the Hindu religion or in the New Age movement, what's called the seven chakras. And you might say, well, I've never heard of that. I don't know what that is. I think it's highly possible that your neighbor knows something about it, that some of the people on Facebook that you are friends with know something about it. I think it's highly possible that uh, maybe your older children might know something about it because that idea has permeated a lot into our culture here in America, whereas before we really did used to be somewhat of a Christian nation. But now we can't be identified that way, can we? Now, we've got so many religions flooding into this country, but it always seems like that the Eastern religions, Buddhism, Jainism, um, um, the Hin Hinduism, uh, things like that, all of those religious ideas permeating throughout America, and you can see them everywhere. They're, they're in comic books, they're in, um, they're in books written for children, cartoons, movies, advertisements, you name it. Just start looking for the yin-yang symbol on packaging and commercials and things like that. You'll start seeing it when you start looking, because it's out there. But anyway, let me explain what the seven chakras are. Notice this chart here that starts down literally in your bum. 
That's where the serpent's coiled up. You've got a serpent down at the base of your spine in your bum. And he's, uh, incidentally, there are no root bundles that are coming out of the bottom two, I think, or bottom four um, vertebra. Okay? No, no nerve bundles at all. It's like God's communication with this earth, which is what this body represents, stops before it goes down into the pit. Ooh, think about that for a minute. Whatever's beneath there, having no contact with God whatsoever. Mm. Anyway, you've got a coiled serpent down there. That's your first chakra, your root chakra. And then it climbs up to your sacral chakra, your solar plexus chakra, your heart chakra, throat chakra, things you say, your third eye, things that you're able to see. Then your crap, notice this, crown chakra. And what, what in the world, oh, pray tell, could that be describing? Hmm, let's think about it. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. Revelation 12. There appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. People, that crown is, the, is one of the heads of the devil. And the word chakra... Let me put it up on the screen here. Chakras have only recently become more well-known, and with the growth in popularity of yoga and New Age philosophies in general, they are a complex and ancient energy system that originated in India. They were first mentioned in the Vedas, ancient sacred texts or, or spiritual knowledge dating from 1500 to 1000 before Christ. In other words... This doctrine was around for a thousand years, at least, before Christ came along. So is it possible that Mary Magdalene could have gotten involved in this? Yes, very possible, because of the fact that it had been around so long. I was kind of curious about that. So maybe they didn't come up with the chakras until maybe a thousand years ago. No, no, no. They were well established in India, which is Hindia because of the Hindu religion and they speak the Hindi language. I didn't know if you knew that. Anyway, there's a lot one can study about them. So what should you know about the chakras? Below is your crash course. Here we go, crashing. The chakra means wheel and refers to energy points in your body. They are thought to be spinning disks of energy. Are you catching this? Spinning wheels. Mm. Spinning disc of energy that should stay open and aligned as they correspond to bundles of nerves, major organs, and areas of our energetic body that affect our emotional and physical well-being. Some say that there are 114 different chakras, but there are seven main chakras that run along your spine. These are the chakras that most of us are referring to when we talk about them. Each of these seven main chakras has a corresponding name, number, color, a uh, specific area of the spine from the sacrum to the crown of the head and health focus. In other words, they're saying that your health and your well-being has everything to do with these wheels. Now, what are those wheels, those energy wheels? Spinning wheels in our body. What, what, oh, what could they be referring to? Um, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 1 and let's find out. Remember the wheels that Ezekiel saw? 
Man. Um, Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 15. Now, as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. Now, now I want you to understand something. Remember, as we're reading this, we understand that this is God's chariot and literally everything on God's chariot is alive. Right down to the wheels. Let's, let's look at it. Verse 16, the appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of beryl and they four had one likeness and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they went, they went on their four sides, and they turned not when they went. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about them four. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Whithersoever, pay attention to this now. Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them. Here it is. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. So wheels, these wheels. In fact, there is a whole, there is a whole worship system in the Kabbalah where they worship what's called the Ophanim. The Ophanim, remember anything with an I-M in Hebrew means plural. The Ophanim are the wheels mentioned here in Ezekiel. Literally, they're worshiping the living wheels of God's chariot. They're worshiping it. To this day, they're worshiping it. Okay? Um, Stephen Greer the UFO guy, emergency room doctor, he practices a meditation uh, practice called Merkaba. Merkaba is the Hebrew word for chariot. So he spends his time praying to the chariots and he meditates on the Ophanim, the wheels, the living wheels, because they have a living spirit in them. So now think about this. If we look back at this chakra chart again, and these are seven wheels, energy wheels, and they are alive, then these seven energy wheels literally are seven devils. And see, they teach that these wheels are not aligned right, which is why you're sick. So they have all kinds of rituals and they'll burn candles on you and suck wax out of your ears and I mean, just all kinds of stupid stuff. But they'll do that in order to align your chakras your wheels. And supposedly when you get all your wheels lined up and spinning right, then you can be healed from whatever disease you have. And believe it or not, there are medical practitioners who actually believe that garbage. So they represent seven devils. It's possible now, you know, how important is this? I don't know, but it's possible from what I can see that Mary Magdalene had fallen into at least some form of Hinduism and the chakra system because she was possessed with seven devils. And that's what, that's what Hindus teach is that by aligning these wheels 
uh, you get them oriented in a certain way and these wheels become powerful and they become alive in your body and they are what's taking over in your body. You are now possessed with seven energy wheels. Seven devils, if you want to call it that. Let's move on a little bit. Oh, look at Acts chapter 10. I like this because there are some people who can be possessed with devils. We've seen that clearly in the scriptures. Those of us who are born again, love the Lord, forsaking everything else. Those of us who love the Lord, we can't be possessed with devils. However, that doesn't mean that devils just leave you alone for the rest of your life. If that were the case, boy, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? But remember, God's teaching us to be warriors, learning how to fight devils. And we see here in Acts chapter 10 that devils have the power concerning us, not to possess us, but to oppress us. And how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Mm, I like it. Healing those who were oppressed of the devil. And sometimes I can, I can kind of tell when maybe one of our church members is being oppressed Okay, sometimes I can tell. It may be obvious to everybody else sometimes when the devils oppress me. Okay, but it happens. And I hate it. Okay, because some of those oppressions can get pretty intense. Okay, like going to Kenya and having all these devils telling you you to leave. Your life is in danger. We're going to take your life. We're going to kill you. You need to get out. You need to leave. You need to get out. You need to get out. Saying it over and over and over like a whippoorwill. Mm -mm -mm. Acts 13, 10. Oh, look at what Paul said to this man. Oh, oh, he said, oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of, of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And that's one of the jobs of devils is to pervert the right ways of God in your life. Again, you don't have to be possessed of a devil. You just have to have one riding along for a while. And eventually, he will talk you into maybe dropping out of church for a while. Maybe not reading your Bible no more. Maybe you gave up on praying. I'm telling you. It's what happens to people. They get pushed. They get prodded. They get oppressed by devils. And pretty soon, the devil has succeeded in perverting the right ways of the Lord in their hearts. A few more verses of, of, of learning, at least from the New Testament, about haunts, about spirits, about devils, and what they have the ability to do. We're going to focus even further on this the next time. Be ready. I have more videos to show you and more stories to tell of just how prominent devil possession, devil oppression, devil apparitions sightings, people seeing things, or cameras picking up things that people cannot see. Just think about that. 1 Timothy 3, 7, Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. Talking about a bishop. Lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Have you ever fallen into a trap? that the devil set for you? You ever done that? Listen, guys. Anytime that you're having a wonderful relationship with your, with your wife, the devil 
will bring the strange woman. Oh, she'll seem sweet. She'll seem like the kind of woman that maybe you wished you'd really married. And her role, the devil puts her up to this, her role is basically to bust your marriage up. And her role then will be to act in such a way as that she is just sweeter than honey. And you fell for it. And maybe some of you did. Some of you left your wife. And then this woman turned out to be pure Jezebel. Mm. That's a snare. It's a trap. And you fell for it. Okay, many strong men have been taken down by her. First Timothy 4.1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to, notice this, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's what I just said a while ago. Devils, like in Genesis 6, that seduced the women in Noah's day and caused them to marry these evil angels. They seduced them. Listen, they're seducing spirits everywhere. Seducing spirits... Um, I've got some things I, I showed during Pastor Mike online last week that has to do with seducing spirits. Now there's going to be a follow-up series to this series here, and it's going to be about the, the UFO movement and how it relates to the occult world. And listen, folks, they're all part and parcel of the same, okay? So... Um, just be ready for that, but let's continue on. Doct seducing spirits, doctrines of devils. Revelation 9.20, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold. So the Bible's telling you that idolatry and devils go hand in hand. Where there are idols, there will be devils. Every Catholic church, every Lutheran church, every church that's got um, idols in it will have spirits in it, hiding out in there, building a nest in there, being a house. Let's read, um, let's read Revelation 18 and we'll close today. Because Revelation 18 nails it as far as where do devils live? In Revelation 18, and we'll, we'll study this further as we move along. I'm going to identify from the Bible different types of spirits and apparitions of them. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Did you see that? Babylon, any place... People, people want to limit Babylon. They say the Catholic Church is Babylon. Well, the Catholic Church is a pretty good uh, candidate for being Babylon. Some say, oh, no, it's the United States of America. That's Babylon. New York is Babylon. Los Angeles, uh, Hollywood is Babylon. Oh, yeah. But what about, what about some churches? Couldn't they be Babylon? Couldn't these churches be the habitation of devils and a hold of every foul spirit? You see that? And a cage of every unclean and hateful bird? There's four things here. 
habitation of devils, hold of every foul spirit, a cage of unclean birds and hateful birds. Okay, four always denotes the spiritual realm and either the right gospel or the wrong gospel. My question to you today is, if you, if you saw the videos at the beginning, if you've ever experienced anything like that, maybe you know somebody that's done something like that. Maybe, maybe like um, when I was in high school, some of the, some of the teenagers down the road from me, I, I'm, I'm glad that I didn't get invited to their parties. I'm glad. But they were having a party at one of the girls' house. They were down in the basement. There's kids in our neighborhood. We were all about around 15, 16 years old, something like that. And they brought out a Ouija board. And they started talking to a spirit. You might say, oh, listen, I don't believe in that stuff. Why not? The Bible calls it divination. The Bible calls it consulting with a familiar spirit. And God said, no, don't, don't do it. Do you think God would announce to the world, don't do this if it didn't really exist? Maybe it just makes you uncomfortable that it does exist. And you don't want to deal with it and you don't want to talk about it because, oh, I don't like to talk about fear. I like to talk about love. Well, listen, Jack, somebody has got to tell this world about the doings of Satan and how he does what he does. He's very subtle. What I was going to say about these teens was that at some point in the uh, Ouija board experiment, Somebody, one of them, levitated off the ground during this Ouija board talk that they had. And you can imagine, everybody is freaked out. So they get rid of the board, everybody goes home. They talk about it, but not much. We can't let this out. What do the neighbors think? See, that, that mindset is still prevalent in America. Because we don't want the neighbors to find out that we saw a ghost in our house. They'll laugh at us and make fun of us. Listen, listen, saint. Listen, Christian. These devils and these ghosts, they're real. And I believe that their appearances and their work is increasing in this world. Certainly we are in a position where we're hearing more and more. And I'm not talking about these ghost hunter uh, uh, shows that are on uh, the History Channel, things like that. I don't put a lot of, because they're, they're after ratings. Of course, they're going to manipulate and, oh, did you see that? that there, was a, there was a thing right there. Young man, the camera just missed it. See, they have to keep the ratings up. And so obviously there's going to be some sort of happening happen. It's just like the TV show Finding Bigfoot. Did you know that they never found him? Didn't even come close as far as I know. But anyway, these things are real. And the appearances and the activities are real. And I believe it's because more and more evil people are empowering Satan's kingdom. And Satan's kingdom is gonna grow and grow and grow and grow until it takes over this world. God's gonna give it to him for a season, okay? But it's all in God's plan. Don't ever forget that. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And this is what I believe and this is what I preach and this is what I believe. You can have the victory over all kinds of devils. If you call out, don't call me, call unto the name of the Lord. And God will deliver you. This is Pastor Mike. Thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for your prayers, your support. 
uh, the encouragement that you send. Thank you very much. Please pray for all, all of our ministries around the world. You're the reason why we do what we do. We will see you the next time. It's getting spooky out there. We'll see you the next time. Bye-bye.